So hello all, welcome to uh, my second lecture in week six. Um, and our next two lectures are gonna focus on the grassroots tactics of uh, the civil rights movement. Um, so we talked about that some last week with the integration of the school districts. Um, and this week we're gonna kind of continue that and look at, um, my focus is basically gonna be on four major um, grassroots actions um, of the civil rights period. Um, so last week we started looking at the first legal uh, decisions of the civil rights movement. These legal actions set a basis for tactics that would help enforce these legal precedents. The laws and legal cases were not enough to gain the civil rights. Um, this lecture will adjust, address uh, sit-ins and freedom rights. So as I mentioned in my last lecture, um, there's a movement that starts. Um, the first sit-ins were actually originally during World, World War II, um, and they were done by the uh, CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. Um, they wanted to nonviolently protest Jim Crow laws. Um, so then there's a new set of, of these sit-ins. So starting uh, February 1st of 1916, Greensboro, South Carolina, um, at the Woolworth White's Only Lunch Counter, four North Carolina A&T students, um, from, uh, students from A&T uh, State University, um, Ezel Blair Jr., um, now Jibriel Kazan, I'm sorry, I'm really terrible with names, uh, David Richmond and Joseph McNeil and Franklin McCain all basically sat down at a Woolworth lunch counter. Um, so by February 5th, it had spread to 40 cities. Um, two months later, uh, it was in 54 cities and nine states. So May 28th, um, I mentioned Ann Moody in my last lecture. Um, Hers is probably one of the more famous pictures from the Woolworth sit -in. so that's this picture down here. Um, she was from Tulugula, Tugula College, so sorry, part of the sit-in in Woolworth in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, by July of 1960, Woolworth would integrate its lunch counters. Um, and one of the reasons that we discussed the sit-in as a grassroots movement and tactic is how important it becomes. So it actually continues to evolve. Um, it starts to integrate lunch counters, but it becomes kind of an attack on all segregated forms of Jim Crow, uh, whether it be legal or traditional. Um, they did kneel-ins or pray-ins at segregated churches, sleep-ins at segregated motels, swim-ins at segregated pools, wade-ins at segregated beaches, read-ins at segregated libraries, play-ins at segregated parks, and watch-ins at segregated movies. So it kind of becomes um, a huge language of the civil rights movement. And beyond the civil rights movement, it becomes a language of other protest movements, um, second wave feminism, and especially the anti-war movement. Um, a lot of the tactics of these later social movements, which we're not gonna talk about as much because our focus is civil rights, um, really take um, these these ideas and run with them. So then, the rest of my talk is going to be about the freedom rights. Um, and they're extremely important for a lot of reasons. Um, the first um, kind of predecessor to the freedom right was the Journey of Reconciliation, um, which was done in 1947. Uh, Bayard Rustin, who is... Um, starts during World War II and continues to be an important part of the civil rights movement. Um, he is a pacifist. Um, he had a lot of left leanings. Um, and he was also a closeted um, homosexual, which at the time was not readily accepted, not even in the civil rights movement. In fact, many um, treated him as an outcast because they were fearful that um, some of his more radical ideas might, or his homosexuality might hurt the movement. Um, and CORE, um, so there were 16 men, um, and then one of them, James Peck, would actually go on to participate in the later Freedom Rides. Um, they were arrested, 
and they served 30 days on a North Carolina chain gang for uh, riding the buses. So the first Freedom Ride, um, after uh, Boynton versus Virginia, um, which made racial segregation and interstate travel illegal, um, May 4th, Core Director James Farm released 13 Freedom Riders, 7 black and 6 white, out of Washington. Uh, their plan is to ride through Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi to New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, where there was going to be a rally. Um, so one of the interesting things about CORE is we often picture um, civil rights activism as these very young college kids, but actually a lot of these early freedom writers, this first group, and a lot of CORE members were actually in their 40s and 50s, and they had been activists since World War II. Um, so they encounter a little trouble in Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia. Um, John Lewis, Al Bigelow, uh, Genevieve Hughes are beaten in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and some of the writers are arrested in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Winsboro, South Carolina. Um, with the cooperation of the cops, on May 15th, a mob of more than 100 Klansmen ambushed the writers in Anniston, Alabama on the Greyhound. Um, they smash slash tires, they smash windows slash tires, um, chase the fleeing bus, and they set fire to it. Then they actually hold the door shut and won't allow the writers to leave the burning bus. And they do attempt to burn the writers alive. Um, so the undercover highway patrolman um, eventually holds them back with gu at gunpoint and the passengers barely escape with their lives. Um, and there's a, a beautiful story that didn't come out until they started memorializing the, the freedom rights. Um, but one of the, the things was J.D. Forsyth, Forsyth McKinney, um, who was 12 years old at the time, her family actually lived in the house and ran the store that they were next to when this happened. Um, she comes out of her house and uh, she gives them water um, and she washes their faces. She says it started with an older lady that she was determined to help. Um, but she recognizes these people in need and despite the pressure of the clan who was there and what her family is later put through, um, being ostracized and treated like outcasts, um, she says that she couldn't have lived with herself if she had not done that. Um, so then the riders on the trailway bus, because there, there's a Greyhound and there's a trailway, um, are attacked in Birmingham, Alabama and Anniston. Um, they're met with mob violence, um, and uh, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who's an activist uh, at the time for the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, um, actually come to their rescue and kind of rescue them from this, this extremely scary situation. Um, Eternal, Attorney General Robert Kennedy blames extremists on both sides. Um, I think the Kennedys are often thought of as kind of advocating for civil rights. And they give a lot of lip service to their advocating for civil rights. But when it came to actually kind of putting the federal government where their conversation was, um, they were very limited in their supports of civil rights. Um, and situations like this where they call out extremists on both sides, this is not to say there are not extremists in the civil rights movement. But all these people were doing was enforcing their legal right to ride a bus through the interstate. Um, so I'm not sure what's about extreme about that um, to demand your civil rights. So a lot of people were very angry with what Robert Kennedy said, that they agreed it was extreme to try to burn people alive, but maybe it was not extreme to demand your civil rights. Um, so Greyhound and Trailway refused to drive any more Freedom Riders, um, and they, they, they felt their lives were in danger, and they basically say, I'm not giving up my life for this cause. Um, Eventually, the core writers fly to New Orleans to attend a rally, um, and there are so many bomb threats and issues with them trying to fly that it actually takes pressure from Robert Kennedy to finally get their flight off the ground. So then there's the second Freedom Ride. Um, it's a SNCC-affiliated Nashville movement, NSM, decides to continue the Freedom Ride, and what Diane 
Nash was the leader, and what she said to Fred Shuttlesworth was, uh, the students have decided we can't let violence overcome. We are coming into Birmingham to continue the Freedom Ride. Um, so, uh, and, and there was a lot of pressure on them not to do this. Their parents, their leaders were fearful for their lives. Um, so it starts with 10 writers, eight black and two white, including John, Lu John Lewis and uh, Hank Thompson. And for those of you who may or may not be familiar that when I say John Lewis, I am talking about the congressman who's currently serving uh, John Lewis. Uh, and Hank Thomas, the two young SNCC writers of the original ride, uh, were two of the members. Um, the bus from Nashville to, to Birmingham on May 17th, um, when they arrive in, in Birmingham, Bull Connor arrests them and, and takes them back to Tennessee. Um, they make it back to Birmingham, Alabama. Um, reinforcements now are 19 strong, 16 blacks, 3 whites return to the Greyhound Terminal. Drivers still refuse to drive them, and they are harassed at the terminal by the KKK. Finally, under intense public pressure, the Kennedy administration extracts a reluctant promise from the Alabama Governor Patterson to protect the Freedom Riders on their journey from Birmingham to Montgomery. Uh, Greyhound is forced to provide a driver. Buses drive towards Montgomery at 90 miles an hour, escorted by the Alabama Highway Patrol. Uh, cars, sirens just screaming. Buses reach Montgomery city limits and the Highway Patrol suddenly disappears. Hundreds of KKK mob the bus and beat the writers and the reporters. In addition, they break the cameras, so there's actually no footage of this exact event. Um, a lot of these pictures are footage of before or after this particular moment. Um, and as you saw earlier, there are pictures of when they burn the bus. Um, the Alabama Safety Director Floyd Mann pulls his gun and stops the, the Klansman. And um, Floyd Mann, um, while it's not cited, is usually thought that's why he was fired in 1963 by Governor George Wallace, because he stopped the Klan. Um, the mob has now grown to over a thousand. It expands towards the Gray Hound Terminal, attacking African Americans on the street, even those who are not necessarily a part of the writers, um, setting one teenage boy on fire and burning the writer's luggage in a huge bonfire. Um, there are no arrests of the mobs, but instead the Freedom Writers are arrested, uh, injunctions blaming them for the inciting the violence. African American cab drivers cannot give rides to the white Freedom Writers, and white ones won't. Um, so it's very hard to get white Freedom Writers to the hospital um, to get their wounds addressed. Um, African-American, uh, a Catholic St. Jude Hospital is the only hospital that will treat both African-Americans and white writers. So that's a lot of white hospitals would not help civil rights workers. Um, and white hospitals would not treat African-Americans at all. So after this, they gather at uh, Reverend Abernathy's First Baptist Church to honor the Freedom Writers. Um, a mob gathers outside and O overturns the car and sets it on fire. Uh, Governor Patterson declares martial law and sends the Alabama National Guard in to disperse the mob. But even after he's dispersed the mob, he forces the protesters to stay in the sweltering tear gas filled building, church, for the entire night. And that's a picture of them. Um, over here in the corner, that's a picture of them. Um, sleeping in the pews and, and trying to rest. Um, so Kennedy cuts a deal with the governors of Alabama and Mississippi to stop the mob violence um, and he will allow and won't fight them for arresting freedom writers. But he basically argues that the mob violence is making America look bad. Um, May 24th, a dozen freedom writers board a trailway bus for Jackson, Mississippi, surrounded by the Highway Patrol and National Guard. Uh, they're arrested when they attempt to use a white restroom and lunch counter for breach of peace and refusal to obey an officer, even though they are, again, exercising their legal civil rights. Um, writers announce there will be no bail. Um, 
at the time there's a law you could be jailed up to 39 days before they would lose their right to have appeal the constitutionality of their arrest. So they decide to serve 39 days rather than uh, bail themselves out immediately to make an statement about, about the unfairness of their arrest and also to um, continue to keep this in the media because one thing that's important and that I'll talk about in a later lecture is media attention. The civil rights workers needed people to pay attention because if nobody was watching, then it was less likely to um, things to change. Um, another Greyhound arrives from the east with more writers. Alabama guards men are either unwilling or unable to protect them. Um, and there's mob violence. And then again, the writers are arrested. So the Kennedys again call for a cooling off period. Um, I think that the Kennedys are often seen because it's kind of during this period as this as this really active civil rights administration, and it's really not true. Often they're telling civil rights groups and agents to stand down, to let things happen, and I think that they feel like nothing will happen unless they push, and they're not wrong. I mean, we're talking some of these events are 100 years after the Civil War. Um, they condemn the writers as unpatriotic because they embarrass the nation on a world stage. Um, June, July, and August, there are more than 60 freedom rides which crisscross the South. Most of the writers converged on Jackson, where every writer is arrested. By the end of the summer, more than 300 have been jailed, including 41 local Jacksonians busted for joining the writers at segregated lunch counters. Um, they're eventually moved to the Parchman Penitentiary, which is Mississippi's prison farm, notorious for its brutal treatment of inmates. Um, and the goal with their mistreatment was to break them. But if anything, um, despite that, they continue to grow in their determination um, to integrate. So, um, as I mentioned, there's going to be another lecture on grassroots movement and tactics. Um, but they're, they're kind of long, so I try to keep, try to keep my lectures at 20 minutes, and this week's kind of intense, I know. Um, so conclusion, um, sit-ins help integrate some areas and change policies for some companies like Woolworth. I talked last week about the Montgomery bus boycott and how originally the bus company actually wanted to integrate before, um, the government would allow them to, that they wanted to keep the law in place. Um, so... Um, these are kind of attacks on economics. I mean, the Woolworth shit-ins, sit-ins, shut down Woolworth for days and weeks, and, and they can't conduct business, and it really hits their bottom line, which is part of what gets them to start to pay attention. Um, and they continue to be a part of the a popular tactic for the civil rights movement and other social movements of this period. Um, the Freedom Riders faced violent opposition, and yet they were continued to uh, determined to integrate interstate travel even when they were often arrested and um, mistreated uh, for what was really exercising their civil rights. Okay, and here's our reference slide for this week. Uh, and this, there's some great sources here on the, the freedom rides and the sit-ins uh, at Woolworth. Thanks, guys. Have a great week.